That's right. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Let's pray. Would someone else like to open us up in prayer this morning? Sure. Daniel or Dylan, you guys have such great prayers. It's so oh deep and music. <laughs> yeah, I can open. Okay. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Jesus, thank I, you for this I'll... morning. <laughs> thank you for Sean. Thank you that he can join us. Yeah. God, I pray you would be with us today. Be in our conversation. Show us what you are wanting to show us. Sorry. And yeah. You know, this is a heavy, heavy, heavy section of the Bible, but it's also so life giving. And thank you for that. Amen. Be among us, Jesus. Thank you. Pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, hey, hey. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good morning, guys. Morning. All right, so we're in uh, Luke chapter 23. And we're reading 1 through 12. We can do two, maybe two passes through this. I'll take one of them. Someone else will take another. One through twelve. So then the whole group of them rose up and brought Jesus before Pilate. Okay, so just a little context. Yesterday we read um, how Jesus was in front of the high priest. Um, and Jesus just admitted to being the, the Son of Man, the Messiah, the Son of God. And, and that set him off, that set off the religious leaders, and now they've taken him to Pilate. So then the whole group of them rose up and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man subverting our nation forbidding us to pay tribute tax to Caesar and claiming that he himself is Christ, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And he replied, you say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they persisted in saying he incites the people by teaching throughout all Judea. It started in Galilee and ended up here. Now, when Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he was from Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who also happened to be in Jerusalem at the time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform some miraculous sign. So Herod questioned him at considerable length. Uh, and Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the experts in the law were there, vehemently accusing him. Even Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. And then dress, dressing him in elegant clothes, Herod sent him back to Pilate. And that very day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. For prior to this, they had been enemies. All right. <clears throat> Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payments of taxes to Caesar and claims to be the Christ, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? <coughs> yes, 
It is as you say, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted, He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, for a long t- because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with very many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there, vehemently co- accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends, for before this they had been enemies. All right. What's standing out today? The blatant lie of verse 2. He says he opposes taxes to Caesar when not like a page and a half before he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tax evasion. Right. It's like in half a week so before he said, pay your taxes. And now they're saying, nope. He said, don't pay your taxes. There was a big old don't on the front of that. He said so. I heard him. Hmm. What about the subverting our nation? Or wondering what that means. What does your translation say, John? Which <clears throat> verse two, the very first accusation. Oh, and they began to accuse him, saying, we have found this man subverting our nation. Yeah. Subverting our nation. <clears throat> it seems pretty political. Like he's a spy or something. Right. Our nation. That's making me think the chief priests were sucking up to Rome. Our nation. Us Romans. We're all Romans here. Right. Oh, Caesar. Oh, Pilate. Ah. They're trying to undermine Rome itself. He's trying to undermine <laughs> Rome. <clears throat> yeah, because if he is claiming to be king, then certainly that would be an issue for Rome. Because Rome decides who's king as it pertains to the Jews, according to Rome. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And what else? Uh, didn't, didn't the Romans, didn't the Romans um, regard their Caesars as basically God incarnate? Mm, yeah. Um, so I mean that you you have a you have a guy here that's claiming to uh, basically rights to the throne in their eyes, like oh this guy's this guy is going to disrupt our political order mm-hmm. by by claiming um, what he's claiming about himself. If that makes sense. Yeah, that's a great point. So not only does Jesus claim to be king. But he also claims to be God, right. both with a big, big issue for Rome. If if he has a following, I, I guess if Jesus was just some guy, some crazy guy claiming to be king and God, they would be like, whatever. But the fact that he's got thousands of people following him, that's a problem. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, they probably put to death insurrectionists that didn't have thousands of people. We're just loners. It's like come in oh. claiming to take over Rome, crucify him too. 
Yeah. I mean, barrier that, to entry. That is what I heard not, the, the, the thieves beside him on those crosses were, where they possibly were also insurrectionists. Or was it Barabbas? No, Barabbas was the insurrectionist. That's right. <clears throat> so. Yeah. The original Greek for that term subverting our nation could be understood as perverting or subverting. Yeah, so that makes sense what Dylan was saying with that definition. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's how it's been. Exp I've heard it explained that way, and that's that's what made the most sense to me. Okay. I mean, especially for uh, the the Jewish Messiah was was. Uh, I mean, this might be a little bit off topic, but. Um, the Jews believe their Messiah to be a political figure that's going to liberate them and establish um, a permanent kingdom in Jerusalem. I, I hope I'm not getting that wrong. Um, so where does it say Jesus before Herod? There's, there's still... When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad for he had been wanting to see him for a long time because he had heard about him, was hoping to see him perform some sign. So, okay, this, this might be, that might be a stretch, but, uh, I mean, even, even Herod is holding out some hope up until the very end, like, oh, this, this guy's got quite the reputation, let's, let's see him, uh, dance like a monkey, you know, but uh, obviously God, that's not how God works. Right. <laughs> um, and he, and Jesus gave him no answer. Like, you know, you know, mm -hmm. going back, going back to, uh, I can't remember where it says in the Bible, uh, thou shalt not test the Lord your God. I think he's basically embodying that, that teaching. Yeah. Um, but I kind of lost track. Sorry, I didn't know where. I thought I had a point to that. No, I don't think that's a stretch. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that there's some application for us in that. Right? Um, I think there's a an attempt for me to demand a sign from God. You know, like you said, Dylan, dance, monkey, dance. <laughs> yeah. um, I think there's something in us that because of our lack of faith, you know, we, we seek a sign from God when he has no plan to provide one. He wants to engage our faith in that moment. Um, so I think that's, that, that applies, certainly applies to me. But it's interesting. Sometimes I have asked for a sign, and then he gives me one. So it's like, but sometimes he doesn't, I guess. So it's, right. it's up to him. He'll dance when he wants to dance. <laughs> Actually, uh, I just found it. April 11th, we read 7 through 9. Luke 9, 7 through 9. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on. And he was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who is this that I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. Uh, so yeah. he wanted to see Jesus. He's been wanting to see him for a while. Yeah. And John, John was Jesus' cousin, right? Yes. So he'd beheaded Jesus' cousin. I, I wonder if he knew that Jesus was the cousin of John the Baptist. I'm guessing he probably did. In the Chosen, they don't keep it a secret, so probably. Yeah. And we all know that's accurate. 
I wonder if there's another account of this interaction between Jesus and, and Herod. I'm curious as to what Her Herod's motive was. He, so he'd heard about Jesus doing these miraculous signs, and he wanted to see them for himself. I guess that's just a normal human curiosity, like, right? Yeah. Well, and even, like, Pilate, when they crucify him, which we're about to read, even Pilate is saying, like, didn't Pilate say, like, oh, there is... I don't find this man guilty. I don't know why we should be killing him, but everybody was like, like, oh, crucify him, crucify him. He basically was like, oh, I'm going to leave it up to the people. And kind of what I was thinking with, with Herod's, with Herod's mindset around Jesus and just his, his political position. Mm hmm. I would think and this may be making too much of an assumption. But I would think he would he would want to keep Jesus alive. If like if it's like oh this guy's performing miracles things like that, I'm just gonna put him in like my court or something, and kind of use him as like political gain. But oh. that again. <laughs> It's always went against kind of their theology and politics, so. Yeah, you're right. So it's interesting that, okay, so Herod questioned him mm -hmm. and then treated him with contempt and mocked him, but it says later on in the next paragraph, um, <clears throat> Pilate basically says, I examined him. He's, I don't find him guilty. And then he says in verse 15, neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. So so Herod had communicated back to Pilate that, you know, I think he's mm -hmm. And they're basically saying, like, oh, we'll just beat him and mock him some more and then let him go. Right. But then the crowd is like, no, we want Barbas, not Jesus. To be let go. And even like Pilate first is like, is like, this is like, oh, are you sure? Like, he even was like, like kind of standing up for Jesus again to the crowd. He's like, are you sure you want Barbas and not Jesus? And they kept crying out. So then he's like, well, if I don't go. And I, and I thought I heard something. And maybe this is going into too much of what we're going to read tomorrow. But I heard something that like they would like in our justice system today, you have a jury, but like there was something about like, they would let the people decide, you know, punishment or hmm. whatever. So they were like the jury in a way? Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Something I found, something I found interesting. Um, just on a quick Google search on Pontius Pilate, <clears throat> it says uh, his. This is before his death. Uh, what happened to Pontius Pilate? He was ordered back to Rome to stand trial for cruelty and oppression, particularly on the charge that he had executed men without proper trial. Hmm. So, wow. Um, and, and I just found that on Google, so I don't you know <laughs> <laughs> on the internet somewhere. Who knows? Huh. But, uh, well, it's it's interesting yeah. you brought that. Yeah, uh, let's go ahead, Dylan. You want to finish your thoughts? Sorry, I was I was I was almost done. The, uh, they they had something resembling a proper trial from the sound of it. Yeah, that's that's yeah, what I was when I read this. I was like, 
this doesn't seem like a fair trial. It doesn't seem like justice to me. It's basically a mob mm-hmm. that wants to kill somebody. And they show up and decide. Yeah, and they yeah. show up and the mob decides. Well, that's I think that's how they were explaining it, too, when I heard it. it. was like, yeah, it was like, you're basically, it's not, it's not unbiased, you know, unrelated jury. It's like, if there's a group that wants to crucify somebody, they'll go and right. become the jury, basically. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And there's no, like, defense. There's yeah. no opposing side right so so the religious leaders were the jury mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's interesting they were the one that they were the ones inciting the people right right they got people all uh, so there's even hypocrisy there because they were they had accused Jesus of inciting the people when it was they themselves that was were doing it in that moment. Well, I'm sure they got other like Romans that were still like very strongly against like the Jews and stuff too. Maybe I don't know. Mm. Yeah, maybe. It seems like Pilate's being being pretty nice, right? In in saying I find no fault in this man, you would you would think a representative you know, a person that represents the Roman Empire would immediately uh, take issue with, uh, you know, what what Jesus says he's doing. Uh, that we, um, a few minutes ago we were talking about, uh, you know, G- Jesus taking the mantle that in, in, the, in the zeitgeist of the Roman uh, culture is occupied by Caesar. So, right. I mean, it seems. I don't know. You would you would think Pilate would be more would take more of an issue with that instead of instead of just unequivocally saying unequivocally, I find no fault in this guy. I, don't know, I, just, I think that's interesting. Are you talking about verse three where he Pilate asks him if he's king of the Jews and Jesus says, "You say so." Uh, <clears throat> I'd be. Where Jesus I guess, is basically. I guess he doesn't. I guess he doesn't flat out say it, but like we talked about in, in Mark, he does flat out say it. Yeah. That, that he is. Right. Know, so the, So in the book in Mark, is that the account? Does it? Does he say that I am? I think. Like, I, I thought we had. The, uh, Caiaphas. I thought we established that yesterday, but I could be wrong. I thought he's. I thought he said uh, Mark's Mark's account is just I am, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. I I have a poor memory. Pilate asked him, Are you, okay, so this is chapter, Mark 15, verses, verse 2. So Pilate asked him, are you king of the Jews? And he replied, you say so. Yeah, I guess I'm wrong. Huh. You say so. What does John say? Oh, I remember what it was. In, in Mark, he said to Caiaphas, yes, I am. Right. Yes, I am. Okay. I thought it was I thought it was both Caiaphas and Pilate, but I was wrong. So in John, he's what does John say? Pilate questions Jesus. Uh, so, so, oh, here we go. Okay, so okay, uh, chapter eighteen, John eighteen, verse thirty-three. So Pilate went back into the governor's residence, summoned Jesus, and asked him, "Are you the King of the Jews?" 
And Jesus replied, are you saying this on your own initiative or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Am I? I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own people and your chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my servants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish authorities. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate said, so you are a king. And Jesus replied, you say that I am a king. For this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world, to testify the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And then that's when Pilate asked, what is the truth? But after that, just like in Luke, he says, I find no basis for, ac for an accusation against him. Interesting. Okay, so that's pretty a lot more detail of their dialogue in John. That makes more sense now. Yeah. So Jesus does say, my kingdom, right? In verse 36, my kingdom is not from this world. So he, he admits that he has a kingdom. And Pilate says, you are a king. But I think Pilate also understands. He's like starting to get it. He's like, oh, but it, he's like, a different type a of different kingdom. type of kingdom. So for that reason, he's he's like Rome is not threatened. Right. He's like, I don't know if it's like he's understanding what Jesus is saying, and he's like grasping that, you know, it's the kingdom of God, or if he's like, oh, this is just some crazy person who's living in La La. He's you know the king of some imaginary place. Whatever. He's done nothing wrong. He has no threat. Ah. Yeah, okay, so what you're saying makes sense. So in verse 37, again, of, of John 19, Jesus replied, You say that I am king for this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And then Pilate's like, what's what truth? Is, what is truth? So from Pilate's perspective, truth. I, what he's saying with that, truth isn't, it's relative. Right. So, okay, Jesus, like, whatever you believe, that's fine. Like, it's not a threat. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because there is no absolute truth. Right. So I think at that point, because there, from, in Pil from Pilate's perspective, there is no absolute truth, Jesus is not a threat. Right. And therefore, he's innocent. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. I found an article on history.com however much you want to trust them <clears throat> according to Josephus in the Roman historian Tacitus Pilate was removed from office and sent back to Rome after using excessive force to disperse a Samaritan insurrection once in Rome Pilate vanished from historical record according to some traditions he was executed by Caligula or committed suicide and his body was thrown into the Tiber River the early Christian author Tertullian even claimed that Pilate became a follower of Jesus and tried to convert the emperor to Christianity. Whoa. Right. Huh. I'm kind of, kind of along the same lines. You know, you have Pilate, but you also have Herod. And what caught my attention and what we read today was like that day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Mm. And that's kind of what made me like, okay, so both Herod and Pilate could be brought together with, you know, this Jesus connection. And I think, you know, just like, I don't know if it was, you know, God softening their hearts or, you know, just them coming to this understanding of who Jesus was. And then what you read about Pilate becoming basically a, uh, follower of Christ, maybe Christian, probably for his his resurrection. Right. So, so that so what was the so like just just the power of Jesus bringing together these two yeah. guys that used to be enemies, right? Like if they realized it or not. 
of what you know Jesus was doing, but they were connected, you know, and had this interaction because of Jesus. Yeah, and Jesus basically made them friends when they used to be enemies. And I think it was because maybe they both had the same revelation of who Jesus was, huh? in a sense. Yeah. That's a stretch to my imagination, but I kind of like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I have always, always thought Herod just kind of continued being the bad guy right all all the way through the end you know right what happened with Herod I don't know historically you know that'd be crazy what if what if like Herod also became a believer and Herod and Pilate like continued to like hang out right talk about Jesus and the scriptures and like pray and like <laughs> Right. <laughs> we like think we think we kind of what is it vilify we, mm -hmm. we vilify them but maybe they turned out to maybe we're going to actually see them in heaven one day that'd be crazy yeah so complications are great oh no, i think you're, <laughs> you're you're reading the same thing i am yeah yeah go ahead i'm maybe a little bit different it says the bloody i don't know how they could possibly know this uh, the bloody ruler of ancient Judea uh, died from a combination of chronic kidney disease and a rare infection that causes gangrene and oh gangrene of the genitalia. <laughs> wow. How'd That's a bummer. That? How did they know this chronic <laughs> kidney disease? Two thousand years. Well, wow. um, That's a good. But th th does it say much about his life after Jesus' death and resurrection? Well, that's like how long was he ruler of Judea or uh, the Galilean area? I guess. I think, was, I think he was installed in like thirty. Yeah, like right before Jesus, okay. Right Jesus' trial, if I if I remember correctly, mm, there were there was a Herod family, the Herod that tried to kill Jesus, and they fled yeah. to Egypt. I wonder if that yeah. was Herod the Great, and his son, Herod. this Herod, the one that's putting him on trial, uh -huh. is like right. a, an, a descendant. A son or a grandson mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm. But Herod the Great succumbed at age 69. Doctors have now, like today, have settled on exactly what killed him. Chronic kidney disease complicated by a very uncomfortable case of maggot-infested gangrene. Whoa. So you said 69 AD he died? No, age 69. Oh, I, what does it say the year he died? Uh, well, it was talking about 4 BC in the other article. So that would indicate like somewhere around that Jesus' before. birth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, it says Hirschman, who is a physician at Veterans Affairs, Puget Sound's care system in Washington State. Blah, blah, blah. It says this could not be explained by kidney disease and was unusual. Um, there's some clues to Herod's diagnosis listed in ancient history books. And this Hirschman guy, the lead doctor diagnosing the case, included, yeah, all the, all the symptoms. Okay. Yeah, he sa it says, some, may, some might say Herod, who died in 4 BC, deserved the unpleasant end. Um, so I think we're talking about the wrong Herod here. Mm. Yeah, that's Herod the Great.
here at this Well, time. we're uh, over about, a little, about five or six minutes over. <laughs> Maybe we should wrap up. Um, any final thoughts before we, we close up today? I, I find it interesting that a God uses a corrupt governmental system to fulfill his will, something that had been prophesied for thousands of years, mm-hmm. um, and ultimately leads to the freedom of humanity, uh, the complete spiritual freedom of humanity. And it, hap- and it happens through this corrupt judicial and religious system. That's, that's mind blowing to me. But I guess God can do anything he wants. All right, gents. Well, let us, uh, let's close out today. Um, you want to close this out? Yeah. Okay. Heavenly Father, um, thank you for another day. Um, we thank you for this word and, and, and what it, what it inspired, um, within us, within our hearts and our minds and the discussion that, that it led to. Um, I just ask that you would continue to to speak to us through this word as we go about our day and um, that it would be solidified in our hearts and minds um, in an impactful way. Um, thank you for these brothers and and ask that you bless their days and, and bless the people they come into contact with. Okay. Uh, I love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. All right. Have an awesome. See you guys. See you guys. Talk to you guys later. You. Take care.